About a year later, in the, in the archives in Britain, I found a photograph of him. Please just punch with myself. I sent the photograph off, a copy of the photograph off to collect. And I said, look, here's Pierre Nixon, Captain Paul. About two weeks passed, I get a letter from her. I open it up, and a photograph falls out. It's a photograph of Pierre Nixon. She said, I think this is a better one. <laughs> She had it all the time. And I wrote her back and I said, you know, you could have saved me about a year of, of work if you had just shown me this. But I said, I know why the Germans never caught you. <laughs> and in fact, all of these years later, we're now 60 years after the war. She deals with the people in this little village, 1,500 people. There were only about 12 people in the resistance. Most people weren't collaborators. They certainly weren't pro-German. They weren't going to stick their neck out in the resistance either. And she still deals with the people in that village uh, in a very circumspect way. Uh, that's that's uh, very much a lot. You'll be able to see her. They're making a, the History Channel's doing a two hour film with the book, uh, with interviews with Colette and the various people I've talked about. So uh, that'll be on. Yes, sir. This has nothing to do with your story, except that years ago, my wife and I were in France, and she was in a gift shop. Somebody else in the gift shop said, as she heard Carol talking, oh, you're from Philadelphia. And it seems like Philadelphians have a unique way of speaking. Is that the experience that Roy went into? Well, well, mention somebody from Philadelphia. Uh, being myself from East Tennessee, when I have to struggle not to say the lie is bright, I'm never going to say anything about anybody's accent. But Philadelphia is quite distinct, I think. Uh, quite, quite distinct. But none of the people, none of the people, the resistance people who dealt with Roy, the handful of them that actually spoke a little bit of English, none of them knew what to do with this accent. They just couldn't. This wasn't the BBC. This wasn't uh, what they were used to. And Colette, I have to say, spoke Elizabethan English. It was, she didn't quite say thou art, but it was all of these quite flowery uh, classical English uh, expressions. Yes? I understand uh, that a good portion of that France was basically almost in the jump civil war between the resistance and those forces that were actually almost like pro German, pro Vichy at the very least. Yes, and certainly from 1940 to 1942, you, uh, France was a tremendously divided uh, country um, with a lot more sort of pro Vichy people. A lot of people were simply opportunists. There were a lot of people in France who were, in fact, pro Vichy, not necessarily pro German. Vichy is a funny, funny place. It wasn't just a puppet state of the Germans, it was an authoritarian French right wing. Uh, political entry, and it drew a lot of support from, from certain elements in France, and for anti-Marxist, anti-communist, and so forth. A lot of resistance people were communists. Um, and when Roy was at, when actually when Roy was in Paris, the people who were hiding him executed a collaborator. They went out to have a hit on a collaborator, and um, they kept talking about something that did in fact happen. Say there's going to be a settling of stores. Uh, as the Allies approached and the Germans and the Vichy government was collapsing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was a, a way to pay for There were a wave of murders. Um, the Vichy secret police were every bit as bad as the Gestapo. The Surete was called. Uh, and Colette was as afraid of the French um, surete as she was of the Stango. Yes? Uh, whatever happened to the traitor, Captain Jacques? Captain Jacques was a man with his real name was Jacques Desauviers. He was a Belgian. Uh, he was caught by the Americans right after the war, uh, turned over to the French. Uh, who um, 
tried and, and executed it. Um, his last words were highly important. Um, uh, the, the very odd things, though. The woman who I, I uh, did a shortened version of this, obviously, but the woman who actually uh, set Roy up with the Captain Jacques' uh, assistant was a woman, but an orange-haired woman. Uh, when Roy was on the train with all the other servicemen who had been betrayed, the one thing they a, a whole series of them said was, they said, yes, I was, it was a red-headed woman, you know, an orange-haired woman, and so it was all this, it was this woman. She was never tried. And Desaubier's trial was done very much in secret. It wasn't a very open, it wasn't a big public trial. A lot of these denazification trials and collaborationist trials in France right after the war were real hushed up affairs. But there was a lot of confusion about who was uh, an embarrassment in France. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Childers' books here, they're a good discounted price, and we have some new refreshments back in the corner. So we'll take uh, a break until 1.30 and we'll start the air panel. Gibson War Roundtables of Civil War Variety are up and sponsored this particular event today. And it may seem, out of, it doesn't seem a bit out of our contrast with this broad into the history of this country and what happened in the very fact we're able to see and hear the story of these gentlemen today it really makes us enriches us all in this situation. We're very happy to do that. So thank you all for being here as well. Again, this is our third and last session of panel, uh, panel session today. And we have the way to out to be a very nice program, isn't it? Air, the Air Force. Our panelists today, and again they'll be speaking as they have and taking questions later, is Reverend Henry Baldwin to my right, Tuskegee Airmen, 99th of Fighter Squadron, Gilbert Alonzo, Bombardier B-17, 385 Battle Group, 8th Air Force, and to my left, Tony Nimick, 4th uh, Parachute Division, German Luftwaffe, fought in Anzio. So with that, I'll uh, start this proceeding with Mr. Mr. Baldwin. I'm going to go find a seat. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is an honor, a pleasure, and a joy for me to be here this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Richardson had asked me to uh, come. He said, you can do it. He said, you do good things in the city. You give good talks. So I said to him, what do you, what do you expect? I'm a Baptist preacher. You know we have a lot of mouth on you, so I can talk. <laughs> Well, I don't know how to, so many things, but here's what I have to do to tell you a little bit about myself first. I'm one of the youngest in the Tuskegee Air experiment that they called. And the reason being was the fact that the war was in bad shape, the Air Force changed the requirements to have the capability of passing a test equivalent to two years of college geometry, math, etc. And that was given to the high school students who were about to graduate who were 17 and 18 years old. I took the test. I was 17 years old. And when I graduated, I was 17 years and three months, but I had already been enlisted. I could not leave until I was 17 and a half years old. What happened in the school was this. To show you how providence would uh, uh, the providence of God in my life. We had 300 young men to take the examination, signed up for it, and I went in to take the examination. And the counselor in the school told me I couldn't take it. They're not taking any Negroes in the Air Corps. I went back to the recruiting officer and told him, he went and told ladies, said, listen, you take care of the school, I'll take care of the recruitment. I will get a promotion if he 
passes because they are taking Negroes in the airport. Well, why did I have that determination? Because way back when I was a little kid in my poor parents' house, reading you know, at kerosene lamps and all of that, a desire came to me, I wanted to fly. People laughed at me for years, but I mean, models, and I bought everything there was to know about flying because I delivered groceries in a wagon, and every time a new magazine came out, I paid about 25 cents or 35 cents to get it. <coughs> and I learned to identify every war plane in the world when I took that examination. Another thing that I'm so proud of is that I studied so hard until when I went in to high school, they gave me industrial arts. You know what I'm talking about, shop. They didn't give me academic. Although I found out later I had an IQ of 127. And I taught myself algebra with some help from the school. That's how much determination I had. That's why I passed the test. Get back to the 300, I passed the test, I was number three, highest score. Well, the recruiting is an officer that's went off. He said, I'm taking you home now. I've got a promotion. You get, my, get the paper signed by your parents. My mother and father were home. My mother said, oh, they're going to take my baby. <laughs> you know I didn't want to hear that. You know? <laughs> my dad said, huh, listen. When he becomes 18, he's going to become cannon fodder. Let him go where he likes to be because he'll have a better chance of coming back home. She tearfully signed the papers. Well, let's get back, let's get down to the actual experience. To get in, all of that was fine. 85 of us through the fruits process of my class, it was one of the largest classes they had. 23 of us graduated. At the time, it was very, very difficult. Let me give you an idea and an analogy. Have, have any of you seen the uh, HBO Tuskegee Airmen? All right, then I don't need to show it to you. But what I want to say to you is this. If you saw that, I'll make an analogy for you. If you've ever been on the ocean, some of you probably have been on the seamen back there. On the ocean, you stand up on the ship, you say, oh, look at all of that water out there. But you know then that there's a whole lot more underneath, right? <laughs> well, the analogy is this. This is the surface of how they treated us. Okay? Now, I'm not even talking to bitters, I'm talking to reality. They were hard. We had to be perfect. But at the time, they didn't realize they were making us the best. When we were in uh, training, one particular thing was, when I had to learn inverted flight, the instructor took me inverted and had me up there for about two and a half minutes, flying 100 miles an hour, hanging on the prop. And he had hit my knee by shaking the stick. And I grumbled, and he said, what did you say, sir? I said, what did you say? I said, I said nothing, sir. So he wanted to wash me out. Any little thing of it, they would wash me out. Well, my dad was, uh, we had good discipline at home, so I learned how not to talk back and all that. Now, in our experiences of flying, we always talked about what we are going to do. We're going to be flying airplanes. We're going to make things better for our people and all that. We were just really gung-ho. And keep that in mind. When we got overseas, from Italy, Italy Sicily, that way, not from England, we wouldn't have made it. Too cold. Too cold. You know, we like warm weather, you know? <laughs> But flying from 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 uh, Sicily and all going over, we went over the Polesky oil fields. We're trying to stop the pants from the business and all that. <coughs> stuff. 
we're flying over these B-17s, sometimes B-24s. It was cold in those airplanes. It was cold. And we, do, in doing all of that, we started flying to escort them. Let me tell you how that happened. When they sent us over there first, they didn't allow us to go up into the air. We were instructed to shoot at airplane, I mean at the ground crews, planes on the ground, trains, supply dumps, all of that. And then the film that I have over here, they would go to the press and tell them those Negroes can't fly. They haven't shot down any airplanes yet. That's a disgrace, but Eisenhower, here. If you want to know some reality, in Tony Brown's journal, Black Eagles, these are actual flight of our flight shooting down and flying in over those oil fields, okay? Now, we turn to go on the internet. We used to be in New York. You can get this is a 90 minute with uh, the narrator was Ronnie Reagan in this. He was a Republican then. I mean, I mean, the Democrat then. Anyway, because it was so cold, we didn't think we could do very much. But one day, one of our guys, by the name of Hall, I wasn't in this particular situation. When we were down shooting at the ground, here are these Germans up here. Don't they have some ducks to pick? You're going to watch until they became vulnerable. And one of the guys said, listen, let them know, we're being watched upstairs. He said, you can't go up there. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going up anyhow. I don't care if I get caught martial. He went up and he shot down the first Buck Wolf 190 that our group had shot down. Do you know they wanted to court martial him? You can't believe that, can you? That's the kind of thing. But. In the camera, in the gun cameras, he had his evidence. Then they started assigning us to groups to escort. Now, the bombers flew raid, I guess about 25,000 feet, and we would be up a little higher. That's the way they wanted us to do it. The reason why they were losing anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of a thousand planes Multiply that in your mind about that. And 10 men to a plane, how many people they were losing per day? Leo Davis Jr. said, we're not going to do it that way. He took it on his own. What was happening was the Germans would send decoys in. Those would go out, engage with them, trying to become an ace so they could come home and get promoted to it. Then the Germans would send another squadron from another direction. And here are the bombers all by themselves, nothing but machine gunners to shoot them down. And they were just blowing them out of the sky. The old David said to us, here's the way we're going to do it. We're going to be stationed over the groups of planes that we are to protect. And he stationed them in positions up above, side, back high and low. His orders were, do not, I don't care if you see a thousand planes over there coming, if they're over there, leave them over there. Don't you move from your position until they come at least halfway towards your bombers. Then you can engage. And then you can get, have your spot covered up. That was the reason. And we covered those boys. Now you saw in here, they said, we want those guys who fly those red-tailed airplanes. Let me tell you two things about those red-tailed airplanes. They didn't know who we were. Number one, you know, we had oxygen masks on our face. So when they saw us doing this, when we first started, they couldn't tell whether we were black, red, yellow, or green. All they knew that we was protecting them. So eventually, we started coming over to our little northern quality airfield, you know, we have, you know, on the side there. And they talked to us 
and they said, we are looking for those fellows who fly those red tail Mustangs. They may be looking at them. <laughs> they had no concept that we were black. But they went back and told the commanding officers, we want those guys who fly those red tail airplanes to, to, to escort us. We started to get a little reputation. I thought that was really. Now, let me tell you why they're red tails. We never received brand new airplanes. We received hand-me-down from the other squadrons. Check, checkers, stripes, different colors. P.O. Davis said, paint all the insignias red. And that's why we became the Red Tail P-51s. Is that all right? Give you a little history with it, too, OK? And so we became renowned. He said, those fellows are black pilots over there. They're good. Now, let me tell you why we were able to do as well as we did do when we engaged. I'll give you another analogy. When I was coaching in high school, I didn't coach basketball, and the kids who played playground basketball, mostly the black kids around the schools where I taught, and they were playing what they call playground basketball, and the school would not let them play the way they played out there, like throwing the ball behind them and between the legs and all that. They do it today, don't they? All those little tricks, right? What I'm saying to you is this. We improvised how to fly that P-51, just like you improvised how to play basketball. We did things with that P-51 that they told us that we weren't supposed to do. Did all that fancy stuff. Instead of doing, doing it correctly, you know, rudder, snap, and pull your stick, and all that sort of thing, we found ways to get out of the way whatever it took. Now, we weren't superhuman, but we were afraid, but we did some things that Germans had never seen before. And they had a lot more experience. We, they were more experienced in years than we were. But what paid off for us was the fact that they were so doggone hard on us down there until they made us good. See? And this is what I use when I talk to young people. When I go out to talk to them, I said, your teachers, they appear to be difficult, hard on you, and what have you. But I tell them this, listen to your teachers. Pay attention to your teachers. I said, they wouldn't be here if they didn't want to teach you something, and if they didn't love what they're doing. I said, but they see potential in you, so you let them lead you, you do what they tell you. And then I give a lot more talk about what I did. I'm a blessed young man. I'm only 78 years old, although I may not look like it. And, but I tell them this. I said, don't ever think that when you go to school, you're finished. You're always going to learn. Now, what do we, what, what does that mean? It means that's the way you stay young. That's the way you become helpful to the country, your community, your family. Learn to do something. Now, this is... I'm a blessed person to be able to do this. I was scared when I was over there, y'all. And I was a baby in the group. And yet I did some things that were very, very crazy. When we used to fly, and my brother here will tell you, in those airplanes, the Germans, I give those those, those, those folks and those farmers all the credit because up in that cold air, all they have to do is look up and see streams. All those German, all those farmers, all they have to do is start shooting ahead of the streams. And they were the ones who should be given the, out the accolades. Now we flew up about, before they were sighted, we flew up about 3,000 feet higher than they did. And then when we got closer, we got down to the opposite. We didn't know how much good we had done there until they started coming over and told us that you saved the lives of a lot of them because they were glad you're here and all that. And I want to make a long story short, some other things that make me hurt you. When we came back home, those of us, some of them came, you know, not all of us came at the same time. What 
really, really, really subdued us was the fact that when we got on board ship, the same old story was going on. Blacks over here, whites over here, off the game plan. Now, I don't know whether you can perceive the hurt that that can give you. And you lost so many of you guys, and so much so, and all we did didn't mean anything. But we did not let that stop us from doing more. What did we do? We became, some of us became instructors. One of my classmates was the first black jet pilot instructor in the United States of America. I'm very proud of that. And know that. A lot of our men are uh, Colonel McGee, he was one of my instructors. When he came back from overseas and gave us some combat training. And what happened was that he came back, he went into the Korean War and the Vietnam War. He just stepped down from president of Tuskegee Air in uh, the United States. He has the recognition of being the, the most, uh, the pilot who has most combat missions in the history of the United States Air Force. That's awesome. A few other things I want to tell you about. Because of what we did, we thought that we were entitled to some things that should have been moved. I'll tell you some other things, one other thing you probably don't know too much about. You've heard about Martin Luther King, when Martin Luther King came and went into the restaurants, and what happened? Nearly 20 years before, 18 to be exact, years before Martin Luther King did that, we as black officers of the United States Army Air Corps went into the offices, dining halls, the Chinook Field and another field, to eat, because we weren't allowed to go in there. So we boycotted, we sat down and integrated. But guess what? They court-martialed 91 of us. But they had to let it go because it would be a disgrace to the service, okay? The last person who was exonerated, was exonerated down in Washington when we had our 95 uh, convention down there, and he was exonerated by President Clinton. I'm just giving you these, these two balances of, of the kinds of things people go through. But you know what all of that did? All of that made me a better man. It made me a better man, made most of us. Now in the Philadelphia chapter, we have some people, let me tell you about this. We have a young man, but well, he's older than I am. And we were shot down after 240 missions. The Germans did not give him any kind of medical. He has a one leg this way. You ever seen that club boot? That's what he has on one leg or the other. Uh, we have a couple more in our, that were, were prisoners, but they weren't utilized. Then we have several of them in our chapter, Philadelphia chapter, who lost their lives. And so we feel an honor when people can come. Okay, I'm all right. Uh, an honor to have this sustained and people come and ask us to give talks about it and short things. But what I do is this, I go to schools, community centers, I go to elementary, junior, middle, high schools, and I give these talks in more detail and show videos. I go to community centers, I go to colleges. But I, what I take with me is this. When I came, let me tell you about some more of my life that, that was in me to be a pusher. I came home, my dad was a plasterer. He said, son, go to school, learn how to estimate to make some money. I've done a million dollars worth of work and we're still poor. I went to school to learn estimating, I learned bad. I went from there to Drexel on scholarship for engineering, civil engineering. I was hired by a company called Fabricity Corporation, pre-cast concrete, and I did a lot of work in a lot of schools and what have you, but the most significant one that I talk about 
is that I know all of the walls and everything in the police roundhouse building. It's because it was made of precast concrete and I had a lot to do with the design of it. Right? Then I wanted to get promoted, put my application in, employment, professional, technical, employment agency on Chester Street. The school district called me in to teach design and camping. On the same day, they called me for an interview. Do you believe this? I was halfway through Flexel, and they said, look, we're going to take you as you are. You must go to Temple, take the Temple courses, and earn your degree. I earned my degree. I earned my master's degree, became a supervisor. I've given all to this discipline, these kinds of things that showed me that you could get through things in your life. I think it's the most challenging situation for any young black man at that time. But let me tell you what I went through. Laughed at, ridiculed, what happened. And this is why I'm so emphatic when I talk to young people or anybody to tell the truth and let you know that hurt is not supposed to stop you from doing it if you know that you have the capability of doing it. And I talked to the young people, I talked to the parents, and I talked to the older students in, the, in college. Don't think because you have a piece of paper when you walk out of here, that's the end of your life. You have it all. You do not have it all. First of all, you don't have any experience in life. Number two, you have to have some variety in your education. You have to have some experience within your education. I also tell them that it doesn't end with a master's degree. I'm still going to school, y'all. Pray for me, and I will have a second, I will, have my, I will complete my doctorate in divinity this time next May. So all of this gave me this desire, this strive to be able to say, yes, you can do it. You can go through things. We caught hell. I, I, I'm being like kind of polite. We caught hell. Didn't we? We caught hell. And, 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 and during that, I feel as though I'm a special piece of this country. And I don't do it with animosity, I do it with determination. I don't know what caused me to become a minister, but one day I was hit hard in my spirit. And I'm a pastor, teach at seminary, teach at temple. And I give this to these young people so that you can do lots and lots and lots of things. I have my Bible. Did you read it in the Bible, sir? You did? I just wanted to see that they you know, got a little specs in it. And this is why I, I don't talk so much about the world. I talk about the things. Going through this whole situation, I was about to quit. That's another thing I teach you. Do not quit on your own. I got a couple accolades and a couple of medals and all that. But the most important thing is I succeeded in this experiment. That's all it was to them. If it had not been for Eleanor Roosevelt, it may never have happened. She went down and told the people, said, look, they tell me you color people can't fly. He said, but I see you flying around down here. And she went back to Washington. I don't know what she told her husband, but pretty soon after that, they opened up Tuskegee as a flying field. I will be going down to Moulton Field where we learned to fly because it's now part of the National Park in the United States of America, where we learned to fly on the ground. I think that's a fantastic honor for them to do that for us, you know, and, and all of our records and what have you. But the field was demolished. I think that I've taken my time. Uh, I, I know you're going to have some questions to ask later on. And we have another speaker here, or two more speakers. All right, so thank you for giving me this time. And then you can get the other part when you ask the questions. Amen?
our second our second uh, speaker of the session. Bombardier B-17, 3D-5 Battle Group uh, of the 8th Air Force, that's Gilbert Deons. Good afternoon. Do you all hear me all right? Yes. My name is Gilbert Alonzo. I was born in Philadelphia. I graduated from Albany High School in 1938. In 1940, when they just passed the new peacetime draft, I was just 21, so I was just old enough to sign up. It means that I would be drafted and be sent God knows where, making $21 a month, I decided to join the 111th Infantry at Broad and Morgan and go away with the Pennsylvania National Guard up to Indian Town Gap. So that's what happened in January. I went into the Guards, 1940. While down on the Carolina when I was in the infantry, it was a Friday, down in North Carolina during the maneuvers of 1941 on our way home <coughs> Jack's Bomb Pearl Harbor. We all got back to Indian Town Gap and everybody in the 28th Division got furloughs except the 111. We had to go out and do guard duty. I got sent, we were broken up, some went to New York, some went to the coal mines and I wound up in Hopewell, Virginia. One platoon of us doing guard duty guarding the utilities and bridges for the Hercules pattern plant. I was guarding on an old trellis bridge. When the train would come over, I'd have to climb down underneath the rafters. After they put up telephone, telephones and heated booths and lights and hired civilians, they sent our whole regiment to guard the Atlantic coast from Hatteras all the way up to Rehoboth Beach. While I was there, they had lowered a qualification to become an aviation cadet. If you had a high school diploma and you could pass the test, you could apply. I made the applications out and I took it up to our colonel, Colonel Corwell, and asked him to sign. He wanted to know why I wanted to apply, and I said, well, I feel I can do more of doing that than I can sitting here looking out at the ocean. So he signed it. Eventually, I was called in, they, they broke us, uh, it was about 300 of us all over. They broke us all down to basic private, took all our specialist ratings away from us and made us Army Air Corps, no longer infantry, to wait to go to the cadets. Finally, got called into the cadets and I went to pilot school. Oh, and I could fly that PT-17, that big double wing airplane, I could barrel roll it and I could spin it, but I couldn't land the thing. <laughs> so, my old World War I instructor, he figured, I'm not going to let you fly. So they sent me back to Nashville, but I had scored so good that they said, you can either be a navigator or a bombardier. I said, well, I think I like the mechanics of being a bombardier. So off I went to bombardier school. And I was quite good at that. And I got commissioned and finished in June of 1943. They sent me on my first assignment. Went up to Boise, Idaho. I'm in a B-24 squad. My squadron operations officer was Jimmy Stewart. I said, well, this is pretty good. But I'm only there three days. Orders come out, and they sent me to B-29 school, and I was no longer in this squadron. I'm going to be a remote control turret officer on a B-29. I'm going to learn how to shift these turrets around to the different gunners. We were in Denver, Colorado. We didn't have any B-29s here yet. They were just starting to make them. We had a mock-up in classroom. I'm doing quite well in it. Two experimental B-29s crashed, one in Kansas and one out in Washington State. It set the whole program back. 
at least six months. So here we are, nothing to do. They sent me down to Pio, Texas to make up a bomb crew. I was sent with Paul Kessler, my first pilot, a radio operator and a flight engineer and the four of us. We started the train and then we got our gunners. From there we went up to Dyersburg, Tennessee for more training. Then to Kearney, Nebraska, and we were given our airplane to take to Scotland. Well, here we're thinking, what are we going to name our plane? How are we going to name this plane? But we're letting the gunners figure this all out. When we crossed the Atlantic, we were told not to fly over the clouds of Ireland. You can't see the ground land because the Germans will beacon the radio wave and you'll be over France and out of gas. And sure enough, the clouds were there and we landed in Ireland. When we got to Ireland, they took the airplane off us because they had a modify. And back and forth, we went between England and Ireland in the phase train. And I finally wound up in the 3-8th with Palm Group at Great Ashfield, not too far from Bury St. Edmunds. It was in the 3-8th with Palm Group, the 549th squad. We got there, and our first mission we happened to have on February the 20th, 1944, the start of what was known as Big Week. It was part of arguing. We flew three missions during Big Week. Now we were getting fighter escort, and they were going to try to go to Berlin. On the 3rd of March, we're heading for Berlin over the North Sea. The B-24 is leading the way. The weather was cold, cold, like he said, minus 60 degrees on the centigrade on the thermometer. We had electric, we didn't have electric suits, we were the furthest to death. The B-24, was weather all around us, the B-24s, they couldn't get through. And they turned around and recalled, came flying through the 17s. I seen a B-17 and a B-24 collide. We lost several airplanes, never published, because they're all lost over the North Sea, and we cannot let the Germans know how many planes we lost. Next day I wake up and we're going to go to Berlin again, this time down through the southern route. We're going down through the southern route and the planes got caught in the jet stream. They never had quite had this happen before. And they're fighting the jet stream and we seen that we, they couldn't make it to Berlin and make it home. And they recalled the mission. But one wing that was ahead of us did get through. And they, I think it was about 30 planes, and they did bomb Berlin on the 4th of March. The rest of us came home. We lost several planes. That was fine. The next day I had the day off. We had the day off. We didn't have to do anything. But on March the 6th, we woke up. Where are we going? Going to Berlin. We're going to go straight in. About 800 of us started in. About 50 of them boarded. On the way to Berlin, we got hit by fighters, by the flak, everything imaginable. We lost 69 bombers, 11 fighters, 105 planes severely damaged. But we got to Berlin and we made it back. <coughs> I was lucky. We only got a few holes in our plane. <laughs> that, that was all right. What happened? We're a new crew. Seventh, we didn't have to fly, but on the eighth, we went to Berlin again. On the ninth, we went there again. We made five trips to Berlin in a week's time. But that was part of it. So we continued on with our missions. I flew several more missions to Berlin. And as we moved up the ladder, I became a lead volunteer and had several leads. Oh, what I did forget to tell you was, immediately after we had flown our last mission to Berlin, when we came there, we were to fly 25 missions. But because we were getting fighter escort, they said, you're going to have to fly 30. And we didn't have enough to have it prorated down a little bit. We were supposed to fly 30 missions, and that would be it. 
but we continued on flying the missions. My 26th mission, I bombed the beaches on D-Day, just ahead of the British, for the British for landing. Flew two more missions, I was coming up on my 29th mission, and armed wing, and this is something that wasn't published, and I don't know whether there was anything more than our wing. A wing consisted of three airfields, three groups. There's no such thing as a tour. You can keep flying till you get shot down, or you can go home for 30 days and come back. Eight of us on our crew had 30 missions now. My pilot, my navigator, they were one or two behind us where they didn't make a mission. And they didn't go. But he said, we'll go home. We, we went home, there was about 300 of us put on the USS West Point. In the main time, we heard that they can't do this. They moved it up to do 35 missions. And had we stayed, we would have flown one more mission and gone home. But however, they put us on the West Point at the Boston with a boatload of German prisoners of war. All of them. This kind of made us a little mad because when the officers were going to eat, we would eat on tables, linen, plates, silverware, three meals a day. The German officers, about 50 of them, they came in and they had the same treatment. Our gunners that protected us, even out of mess kits, two meals in a bag lunch. And we felt this was so unjust. We almost felt like we didn't even want to eat. But there wasn't anything we, had to, we could do about it. We had to live by the Geneva Convention. However, we got home. I spent my 30 days at home in Philadelphia, going back and forth to Atlantic City. And eventually, I had to report to Atlantic City. And when we got to Atlantic City, they gave us all physicals. And they said, we don't need to enlist the donors back anymore because we're cutting the ground crews. We're cutting the crews down from two ways from one way spot. So they didn't have to go back. They only sent the officers back. When we got back, the pilots, they sent them by transport. There was only about four of us in you know, my group. When I come back from my squad commander who looked at me and said, what are you doing back here? They may come back. They should have never made you come back. I said, well, what are you going to do? And he gives me a job in group headquarters. He said, well, he said, I don't think you should be flying mission. I'm not going to fly you. All right, whatever. And that's what they did with us. Well, that happened for a while. He got shot down later. We got a new CEO. During that time, while I was, this was in September when I had returned, on October the 6th, our squadron, went on a mission to Berlin, the 549 squadron. We had the whole squadron, 11 planes wiped out. They missed an IP and they got hit by 75 German fighters. Like the entire squadron. And a little later, on December the 24th, Colonel Castle, who is now a general, Colonel Castle, he gave me my DFC. General Castle went on the last flight mission to support the troops at the Battle of the Bulge, and he got shot down and killed, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. But shortly afterwards, in February, we had a crew over there. The volunteer flew with another crew, and he didn't return. And my new CEO, he said, I'm going to have to put you back in the air. And of course, I couldn't refuse because the deal was when I went home, it was more and more. I maybe I could have pulled it, but I wasn't going to. I said, all right. So I flew 20 more missions with them, made another mission to Berlin. Everybody used to want to fly with me and said, man, he's lucky. <laughs> Every time he goes out, he comes back. And nobody ever gets hurt. And believe me, that's the truth. I used to say my prayers, and when I reached 50, 50 missions was unheard of 
flying in bombers and the AZ Air Force. There was once in a while you hear one here and one there. But my group operations officer, he took me into our new CEO, who was Colonel Jumper. And he said, here's the first man that ever flew 50 missions of our group. I think you ought to let him go home. And he says, all right, we'll let him go home. So they cut orders and let me go home. But the war was over about two weeks later. <laughs> I was on my way home. I was on the boat. And I was the, the first boat load that was still in England when the war was over and came home. Our, our CO before Colonel Jumper was Colonel Van Devender. And he was the one that flew the nurses out of the time during the out in the Pacific. And, uh, one of the reasons why we were quite so lucky was because Van Dievender, he made us fly perfect formation. When we didn't have a mission to fly, we'd be up practicing formation flying. He said, you keep your formation together, German planes, they won't attack the tight formations. So they're afraid that they'll run into you and they know that you're well prepared. All through the war, we had very, very few attacks by enemy planes. Even later, the same thing when Jumper was there. It's one of the reasons why I think I got through so much. Well, however, war was, I'm on my way home now. And I get home and I thought, well, I have to go all the way out to California. I couldn't go down to Atlantic City because I wasn't married. They're going to send me to Santa Ana. And I had met my future wife, and I said, don't worry, as soon as I get out to California, I'm going to be the first guy out of here. I got 165 points, and that's what I had. First man out. You think they don't know what they were doing? Right before I got out, they froze my specialty. They had volunteers that were never overseas, was already processed and getting out, and I was frozen. The whole group of us, we wind up down, there was about 200 of us down in Midland, Texas, getting physical, and they're getting ready to prepare to train us to go to the Pacific. But they dropped the A-bomb. And after they dropped the A-bomb, well, they finally let me get out. I went up, and I was supposed to go up to Indian Town, but they lost my orders there, and I wound up in Mitchell Field. When I wound up in Mitchell Field, I signed into the reserves, which was one of the best things that I did do. I stayed in the reserves until I made my entitlements. I went home and I married my sweetheart, and I have three wonderful sons that are all doctors, and that's it. The bad part is my spouse passed away two years ago. Other than that, I've had a pretty fortunate life. And I guess that's what happened. Thank you, Joe. Very good. Tony was showing me, uh, I guess, your flight record was flying around, was floating around here. And uh, you certainly are that last certificate that fits that. Lucky bastard said so. <laughs> certainly am. But thank you so much for that. Our final, our final love. Uh, Panelists today, 4th Parachute Division, German Luftwaffe, Tony Nemec. I hope you didn't hear my knee squeak. I didn't lubricate in this morning. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here and talk to you. Uh, because of the time limitations, uh, I need to tell you things that Some of the events, not necessarily combat, maybe during combat, but not really during the engagement. Others happen outside of combat. Some of the things I may tell you, my wife uh, will probably disapprove of. She's looking at me now. <laughs> uh, I'll probably move to dinner for three days. <laughs> but I'll tell you anyway the way it was. Uh, you know my name from the paper, it's Tony. I was born in Prague. Uh, how I got into the Luftwaffe, very simple. Uh, 
my dad died when I was 11 years old. Uh, and my mom, she remarried. And her second husband was a Sudeten Deutsche. That's the German. Sudeten Deutsche. Okay. He was a Sudeten German. And after the occupation, of course, uh, dad was. Uh, oh, I forgot something. There is such a thing that doesn't exist in this country. You could have, back then, you could have been a German national, but have a Czech citizenship. In this country, that's not the case. You're an American, period. But they differentiated nationality and citizenship. And today, dual nationality or citizenship exists in Europe to this very day. So anyway, and after the occupation, uh, dead automatically became a Reichsdeutsche. A German citizen. Four years later, I had, a, I had a call to report for exam. I didn't even speak German. And the sergeant of interview with me, he told me, we call you again in six months and you will speak German. I did. <laughs> and I knew better not to. But anyway, Luftwaffe, because I was studying aeronautical institute in Prague. That's how the Luftwaffe got hold of me. Boot camp, that was boot camp. By the way, this was August 1943, very important. Boot camp was in France, in Loire, on the Loire River, which is, I don't know, some 80, maybe 100 kilometers due west of Paris. Boot camp was not very long, but we had some very fantastic experiences. Uh, the DI, his name was Bergam. I was his boot bike. He was nice to me. I shined his boots. He had a French girlfriend. And he gave me all his rations. So I liked him. Even though I had to shine his boots. I got all his rations. After three or four, I think it was three or four weeks. We didn't have a pass, as usual. Boots don't get a pass right away. After four weeks it was, I believe. We expected a pass for Sunday. And he took us to the parade grounds. There was 18 of us in my group. This is the part my wife doesn't like. And uh, we had to demonstrate that we know how to salute before he would let us go into town of Blois. It was like five kilometers on foot. And we walked every time we had to go there. So we had to prove that we know how to salute. We had to raise a salute five steps before him and hold it five steps beyond. He was just busting our choppers. He knew we know how to salute. And then he stood in front of us with a typical pose of the eye. Legs spread apart, breeches, boots. And he says, how old were we? I have to tell you, 17, 18, 19. And he says to us, tell me, boys, how many of you ever spent a night with a woman? And, you know, uh, these guys, some Germany, in Europe, I think, was Victorian. I'm not saying things didn't happen, but nobody talked about it. Some guys blushed, and he just stood there and waited. And he says to us, nobody? All right, we all go. A <laughs> <laughs> cat house in Germany is poof. So he took us, it was 18 of us, and that son of a gun, he waited with us until all the guys were you know, you know, let me tell you something. We, we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know why he did it. Uh, he had ulterior motives. He wanted to really, he knew we were going to be shipped out. And he really wanted to know the layout of the cat house because he was going to free the madame of the cash box before we went out. But anyway, when I think about it today, I think he did right. Because most of the boys got killed. They never had a chance. Maybe that too was part of his mind. From Blois to Germany for physical examination, we had to run I think five kilometers in I don't know, 20 minutes or something. And then to jump school. Jump school was in very Dreiskau, uh, which is uh, the southwest corner of Germany where Switzerland, France, and Germany meet. 
junk school. And remember, I told you that was in August when I was called. I was in junk school, just finished junk school, Christmas and New Year's. New Year's. We were on a train to Italy. So today, when I look at training films of paratroopers, German paratroopers, before the war or in the early part of the war, our training was not as rigorous, not as thorough as the former guys. Why not? Well, because they needed bodies. When they start drifting 17, 18, and 19, you know, they got problems. They didn't come on and footer, you know, cannon for So everything was shortened up, some exercises, theoretical, practical, were eliminated altogether. But anyway, in Italy, I was assigned to a mortar plateau, 8 centimeter mortar. And on, uh, in Pozzuolo, which is not far from Perugia. And the uh, Allies, Allies landed uh, at Anzio on the 22nd January. I was still in more of the training. Alarm came uh, 4 in the morning on the 20, 23rd, I believe it was. And we were on the track the same day in the afternoon. And that was end of January. By February 10th, my birthday, I was in a function at NC. So that, that how short the span was, how compressed. Uh, I made a friend in jump school, and this is one of the things that doubles me. Fritz Bank. Uh, we made friends, and even though we were told never share a foxhole with another soldier. Because if you get hit, you're losing two instead of one. But in combat, our platoon sergeant and boy, Lieutenant Schlotz, he was a nice guy. He overlooked many things in combat. Some of the disciplines were just oblivious. We never had to do. And he didn't say anything. And Fritz and I, we shared the same foxhole at NC. Before the first offensive, because the beachhead was already established. We were, I think, three or four kilometers in the area of Provencia, Ardea, and uh, Cisterna Latina in the Pontine Hills. It's not mountains, it's rolling, rolling country. And he and I, we shared the food packages, we shared our letters, we shared everything, cigarettes, the whole schmear. And then one day, uh, I was on a message run. I went down a hill to the company headquarters, and in the meantime, another messenger from the company came to our platoon with another message. And the message was, uh, more warned, the squad, the first squad platoon, was had a full hit, and the guys were killed, all three of them. So they were looking for volunteers. And Fritz Bunker volunteered. He never got up front. A dive bomber came and strafed Rio Casalina, and Fritz was in a foxhole. And a bomb hit so close to the foxhole, it burst his lungs. And uh, what troubles me? What troubles me? Had I been there with him, I would have been with him in the first place. So sometimes that happens. But let me tell you something happier. As you know, today some people say that I spoke American officers to and German officers. Why the beachhead at Nancy and Tina? It cost 4,400 lives. The war was lost. Everybody knew it, but nobody talked about it. Because you just somebody somebody had said, oh yeah, Tony said we lose the war. I was a dead man. So nobody spoke it. But we knew it. It was just a matter of time. But Winston Churchill, as I'm sure you know, he felt the way to get Europe and get Nazi Germany is to the soft underbelly, which was Italy. And by the way, Italians, the Fourth Division was never full strength, number one. Number two, 
founder group was an Italian product group of leadership, Foley Learning. We had six guys in my team. They were good soldiers. They all died at the end. So when somebody says, oh, yeah, the Italians were good soldiers, probably they had the heel on the wrong side of the ship. Not necessarily true. These guys were really, really, really good soldiers. One day, I was in a message run. Stupid thing. I told you that you memorable. Oh, by the way, the most memorable thing to me in boot camp was the trip to the booth. I was more important than arm training. That was most memorable. And I was in a message room. And I came up on the knoll, and the front was up ahead. I didn't know exactly how far. 200, 300 yards. I could hear machine gun fire, but I couldn't see anything. I just saw grass. And I came up on this little hump. They were the dead soldier. He was an officer, English officer, no, Irish, because he had the right shoulder. It was a patch, Eric. So he was Irish, I knew that much. And uh, he had on a pair of beautiful boots and breeches. And I had a lot of the boots that they didn't fit. They were wet and they hurt my feet. I wanted his boots. And, you know, I felt he doesn't need them anymore. <laughs> and I tried to pull him off. But I, I think he had to be there for a few days, maybe since since the landing and the German counterattack with uh, Oberst Heilmann. I couldn't get him off. I had a super soul in my body. I couldn't get him off. And then I did a stupid thing my life that I think a soldier should never do, especially emotional idiot like me. He, he was lying in one of the he had English blouse and one of the buttons was off. And there was a piece of paper sticking up. So I reached in his pocket and I pulled it out. It was, it was a letter. Now I didn't speak any English. I was a few words from American Louis darling love and hands up. I knew hands up for cowboy movies, yes. And I opened it up and there was a photograph in a letter. And it was a woman and a baby. And I stood there and I was, I was gone. I forgot where I was and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, she, he was dead. Why do you miss me? And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm standing there and I see dust jumping all around me. But, you know, I heard the guy, but I didn't. I just, I was so fixed looking at this picture and this letter. I didn't pay any attention. And then, then I woke up and I hit the dirt. And I knew it was machine gun. I hit the dirt and I lay there for a while. And then I took my gas mask, I threw it out because he had cigarettes in his pockets that I didn't have. And also the gas mask, I had cigarettes gas mask chemistry. Something happy. Supplies. Supplies were always there. Not just ammunition. Ooh, sometimes it came, sometimes it didn't. So we organized. And one day, one day, we came to a farmhouse. And it was built in a rectangle. And in the, in the middle there was eight, eight of us. And in the middle of the farmhouse was a big pile of manure. And there were other soldiers there. Oh my gosh, you know this. <laughs> and, you know, and on, on top of the manure was a chicken. Sitting on top, there were other chickens, but they were running around. But this one was sitting on top of the back. I, I, you know, I, 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 immediately, I saw chickens. I hadn't seen the chickens since before the war. And I said, I'm going to look at the chicken. It's one of the chickens. I carried a Luger with me. So I'm going to shoot the chicken. You know, I was like, like the wall. So I left my Luger in my head. And I shot the chicken was stupid. And the chicken wouldn't fall. It's stupid. And this bunch of hyenas from my platoon, you know, they were laughing. Nobody told me. I, I, I was a city boy. I didn't know how to kill a chicken. I said, I'm going to shoot it. And I'm going to talk to you, stupid. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and 
when the chemicals start to take me away, I go around the menu by the was a chicken was gone. We had a hack of chicken store. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, I, I forgot to tell you something. Uh, you know the first story I told you about Paris and uh, Charlie Bergal to Vesco, House of Human Repute? You know, I know Eleanor can understand, and she always <laughs> asks me. But I still remember the girl's name. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Her name was Gilles Dali. Gilles Dali. I should know. But there was Anita oh, that's another that's another story. Okay. Some people asked me before how did I how did they come to the States? As you know, Casino, Monte Casino fell on May 15th uh, because the French, French expeditionary force landed on the Adriatic Sea, 35 kilometers above the Gustav Line. That's where Casino was and Anzio Natuna. So we had to leave. Casino fell after three assaults. It fell. By the way, you know, from Monte Casino, from the first division. Very few guys came out, most of them perished because the fantastic assault. Another important thing is, were we in the Abbey? No, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we were not in the Abbey. Uh, we were on the hill, but not inside of the Abbey. We were in after it was totally destroyed, bombed. Then we were in the Abbey, but not before, and I'll tell you why. An abbot, an abbot in German is up, A-B-T. But you put a dot after the T, A, B, T, dot. It means Abteilung. Abteilung could be a department, a section, a group of men. And about two years ago, in England, an article was published, translated, and subsequently reprinted in the Spiegel. And the theory of one of the former OSS officers he believes it was a translation error. And it meant up dialogue, you know, group of people in the air, instead of abbot, up. So I think it was a translation error. But anyway, Casino fell, allies there in Rome, I believe, uh, June, June 5, June 4 or 5. And uh, after that, it was just a continuous retreat every so many days. Very seldom did we stay in the position more than four or five days. And we moved all the way up uh, to Florence, to the Battle of Florence, there was a uh, foot of us fight, and then we wound up in Mirandola La Pila, uh, which is north of, uh, north of Bologna, not far from Modena. And that's where I was taken prisoner. How was I caught? I was coming back from a battalion, but I did not know that in the meantime, the group moved. Again, message, by the way, most communications were on wire, not wireless. The lines were continuously destroyed through artillery fire. So very often, instead of calling on a field phone or on a wire, they sent a message. So while I was coming or going back, coming back, I don't know, another messenger came and they retreated to another position. I didn't know this. I went up the gorge and I had some ammo with me and I had a rucksack on my back. And it was very strangely quiet. I didn't hear anything. And I came up to the house, Casanova. The house was called Casanova. It was a very lonely farmhouse. I had a couple of barns. And I walked up and I didn't see anything. I didn't, see anything. I didn't hear anything. And I went back down the hill where the ammunition that was for the water. It was empty. And I turn around and I walk into the house and I walk out again and I didn't see anything. I was alone. And I said, well, I went in the barn. I went into the barn where hay was. And I come back 
from around the corner to the house and they were full GMs. Three guys had an M1 carbine and the one guy he had a DAR. Well, what did they do to him? They cut the piece of property, uh, some of the things they felt appropriate to misappropriate. <laughs> What troubled me, I didn't get it in my group, of course. I had, I had a camouflage in my pocket. And in the pocket was my favorite secondary pipe. I always wanted a secondary pipe and my Italian pipe. And I didn't want to even scratch it. So, and, and he just took the net and threw it uh, the pipe. I pointed at it and I turned up and trying to bend over. And uh, stuck the barrel in my ribs and then gave me a message from the my pipe. They sent me to Leghorn, camp for POWs. Fortunately, I didn't spy the way. Leghorn, we had pop tents. It was loaded with German prisoners of all denominations infantry, artillery, Luftwaffe, paratroopers, you name it. Pop tent. Six guys in the pop tent. So you can imagine. You can imagine the comfort we had, six guys. It was raining, so we had to dig a ditch from one end of the tent to the other, so we had at least about water. So you know the comfort we had, but the food was good. It was good, that's the first time I saw white bread and butter in years. In a period of your camp. So they didn't miss me. Anyway. Fortunately, I didn't stay there very long. I did a couple of weeks, 10 days. Hit us, uh, he put us on trucks, took us to the harbor in Leghorn, Livorno. And uh, I don't know if it Victory Ship or what was the other one? Victory and. Uh, there were two different ships, Victory and Liberty. Liberty, Liberty ship. I don't know which one it was, one or the other. And they shipped us to the States. I think it took us uh, over three weeks before they shipped exactly because of submarine major things like that. And we landed in Norfolk. Uh, in Norfolk, we were at the house because we were both of these guys, coolies. It was terrible. And uh, then they shipped us by train uh, to Little Rock, Arkansas. We didn't, in, in the German army, we, we traveled in kettle cars. About 40 guys to a kettle car plus equipment. We had Movement. <laughs> Diabetes seeds, ice cold, water, you know, wanted to. We had food three times a day. You know. The best thing that happened to me, I had a Listen, I, I, I'm serious. I was a good soldier. I, I had three, three pepper hearts. I was wounded three times. I'll tell you something else about it. You know, I had a, my, my badge, of course, and I had a assault, ground assault badge, too. So I was a good soldier, but listen, you know, I, I never wanted to be killed, you know, to act with that. I like to wait and die, normally. So I was okay. I said, war is over for me, Finny. And in Arkansas, Camp Robinson, uh, I guess we stayed there a week, maybe two. Uh, we had beds, mattresses, my bed sheet, cushions, cushions, we had blankets, we had a table full of food. So hey, listen. This was, uh, I, uh, I had realized that I became a prisoner in, in America and started working with American people, both civilians and GIs who guarded us somewhere. Sometimes they fell asleep, but we didn't want to run away. <laughs> we had it too good. Why should we run away and go away? <laughs> well, where would I go? You know, geez, I look like a king in Taj Mahal. Why should I run away? It was beautiful. Huh? But how long did we stay there? I don't know, 10 days. And then they shipped us to uh, branch camps. And I was in, I was in Bazet. And Bazet is, you heard about the shooting in Jonesboro a couple of years ago. Uh, Bazet, if you, if you travel south, south and little southwest, you have Jonesboro, then comes Blythville, then comes Joyner, and then comes Bazet. And Bazet was a POW camp. Army tents, it was six guys to attend. And I became a cotton picker. Not very long, I then worked in the cotton gin, pressing cotton seed, you know, like you know it. 
And the best thing in working in the cotton gin, as hot as it was, was we used to buy, we used to buy tasty bread for tasty toast for 10 cents. And then when the breast first squeezed, we'll go behind the breast where the oil came down and we soaked a slice of bread in the oil and then eat it. Folks, let me tell you, I weighed 220 pounds. I, I had no neck, you know, it was small. <laughs> so why should I, why should I have a neck? What am I going to do? This is it. Now, I couldn't go, uh, I was discharged from, from Nazareth. May, beginning, yeah, I think it was beginning of May and back to Camp Robinson, and from Robinson they shipped us to Bolbeck, Bolbeck, Le Havre, and outside of Le Havre is a little, little bird, Bolbeck, and that was another POW camp, and I was fortunate because I was not born in Germany, they let me go after a few days, they discharged me. The other Heinies, who were native Germans. The French kept them for another two or three years. I was fortunate, they discharged me. Uh, I didn't know where to go because if I had come back to Prague, they would have hung my rear end. Because what am I doing in the German army? How I got in, that was of no consequence. The upheaval after, during the revolution, which broke out in Prague on May, May 8, you know, they were just killing everybody. We were German, I had a German uniform, it didn't sound right. They hung them on lampposts all over the place. They would have done the same to me. I couldn't go back. Where were I going to go? I had one thing happened to me during the fire mission in Nancy. Uh, the mortar, to the side. What do you put to the side? It's an additional charge you add to a mortar grenade to make it go fair. Is it, a, is it an additional charge? What do you call it? Huh? Filament, okay. And you add, depends upon how far you want to shoot and the inclination of the barrel. And I need a two or three rings, I don't know how many. Then I open up the box, and there was a piece of paper. So during the fire mission, I could have no time to look at it, you know, so I stuck it in my pocket. And later, when I was back in the folks' home, I opened it up and looked at it. And it was the name of a girl in Frankfurt. Mein said, 115. So I didn't know of any other place to go. So I picked Frankfurt, a mine, to be discharged to. And I went back to Hansel-Anstrasse, which is just a block from the main train station in Frankfurt. The house was gone, bombed out. So anyway, so for a few weeks, I slept at the railroad station in the waiting rooms and in the freight cars. But that's a long story. And I think my time is running out. Oh my god, yes. It was good talking to you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And there is so much more I could tell you. Maybe I'm going to write a book one day. <laughs> Including all the things my wife doesn't want me to tell you. Thank you. I guess we do have a, a, a little running on the light. We have some time for a couple of questions anyway. Out here. Somebody has some questions for each other. Okay, good. That's what we'll do then. All right, guys. Take a little break. Okay. Okay, if anybody has any questions for any of the panelists. Please ask the question. I, I have a question for Tony. Um, after Crete, it's my understanding that the Falsch and Jaeger were no longer um, used as maritimes. Is, is that the case? We didn't get yeah. a combat job at all? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Look, I'll tell you what happened. Crete, unfortunately. Yeah.
never got to uh, answering a question uh, when I made the statement we never lost a, a bomber. The United States government documentation about all the blacks that ever served this country, you'd be surprised how many medals of honor that uh, all the way back from uh, the beginning of the country. Uh, keeping in mind the Revolutionary War, Christmas addicts in the beginning, Boston Tea Party, uh, Pearl Harbor, Dory Miller, Cook, that's all he could be in the Navy at that time, but he was a, he was a hero because he ran the machine guns and what have you at that time. And so I want to t uh, <coughs> give credence to the statement I made here in this, and you can purchase it, the United States Government Printing Office. So you take this with you, and if someone denies it, you can tell them. May I read it to you? The 99th Pursuit Squadron, which was later named the 99th Fighter Squadron, worked throughout the Mediterranean and European theaters and became a respected group of fighter pilots. Perhaps the unit's greatest claims to fame were, number one, as a bomber escort group that protected American bombers on their missions deep into Europe. The 99th never lost a bomber to enemy fighters. Number two, we were responsible for the several other black units and what is happening today. It's official. It's not just hearsay. Andrew. Okay. Yes, ma'am. teacher in Virginia, okay, that gave me a reverberation in my ear. Uh, I have two of them, but I don't wear this one because Betty doesn't sing too good and she sits on the side of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> my daughter also teaches you know, hard to teach down there in Virginia at her school. So, it wasn't a large class, maybe 10 or 15 kids, and some of them with her heads down, and they don't think they're not paying attention to all this. And, but later on, she called me and said, where those kids are walking through the school, think that was a grand thing, that's all they talk about, was talking to them. I put my uniform on one, my gray on the other, and the little black girl raised her hand, I said, yes, dear. She says, were there any black characters? I said, you bet it, dear, the triple nickel. And that was a five, five, five. Yeah, and she was so tickled with that one. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Really nice. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Kat. Yeah, uh, this is for Tony. How did you get back to the U.S.? Because you said that, you know, you, when you were easy on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> How did, I, how did I get back here? Jesus, I'm, I'm telling you my life story. <laughs> well, uh, as I told you, you know, I found that this is a country where milk and honey flows, in spite of what we were told by the Dr. Joseph Gibson, the Prime Minister. You cannot hear me? Yeah. Oh, oh, I, says, I found out that this is a country where milk and honey flows, while I was a POW. I went to school in Kent. I studied history, I studied history, I studied civics, and I studied English one, English two, English conversation in the POW camp. Because I knew what was coming. Who was gonna be in Germany? The Americans. Okay? So I had to speak English and I said, I'm coming back to this country. It took me seven years to come back. How, how did I get here? I applied for a visa. And Back then, of course, there was such a thing as a waiting list, which doesn't exist today. Right? Seven years before I got a visa. And how did I come here? Um, see, there's another woman in there. <laughs> I should have let it like in my ship. I should have let it at that. But anyway, I, uh, I 
was on the telephone once. I was working in uh, headquarters in Frankfurt, IG Farm. And uh, I was a dispatcher at the time. I had a phone call for an automobile, for a sedan. Uh, I had a telephone call for a sedan to a certain address. And uh, I asked for the lady's name. And she, she told me it was Janice. So I write it on a trip ticket, and then I look at it. And the, the longer I looked at it, the more I realized this is a Czech name. It's Janusz. Actually, it's Slovak. So the next time she called uh, for another car, I asked her, Jesus, you know, uh, may I ask you? She says, yes. I says, your name is Czech. She says, no, no, it's Slovak. And she was a girl who was instrumental. In, at that time, you had to have a sponsor. The sponsor, my sponsor was Mr. Moorcraft, and he owned the oil, fuel oil and coal yards in Dundalan, New Jersey. And she got in touch with, with her family, they got in touch with Mr. Moorcraft, and they told Mr. Moorcraft, look, he is the guy, he is the best, you need him. And he sponsored me. But by the time I came, you did no longer need it as much. But it was another girl who was it. And the funny thing is, was going to wipe you out. Eleanor went to school with Helen Jennings. Small world. That's how I got here. Thank you for asking. Well, I, I don't know if I should thank you. That's all right. Anybody else? Uh, I have a question for Reverend Baldwin. Reverend, you flew the P P-51. Did you ever fly any other fighter aircraft besides the P-51? Yes. Uh, I compared to the P-51. Well, that's another story, but I think it's an interesting one. Uh, when we came back, and after all that confusion, uh, the, war, <coughs> the war wasn't exactly over. And uh, I have single and multi-energy rating. That, meant, that means I can fly bombers. Took us down to Kentucky and I learned how to fly B-25s. And while they were teaching us, I had no idea what was happening. They were teaching us how to take the B-25 down 100, <coughs> to reach 100 miles an hour. First of all, we had to rev it up here, and then to run down until it reached 100 miles an hour, snatch it off the ground and level it off. And we did that over and over and over. We didn't know exactly what, why we were doing that. They were going to replicate the the uh, the the uh, Jimmy Doolittle raid on Japan, and we're going to, they were going to put us on carriers to take off the bomb Japan again, probably with more sophistication that we dropped the bomb. But I do have that rating. Unfortunately, I had all that rating, and uh, uh, I just missed, I was just a little bit too old when they did open it up for blacks to fly the commercial rating. I had commercial qualifications and everything, but it's just time, you know. And uh, so I took that as there's another direction for me to go. And that, that really uh, was it, was it there was one fight that was very difficult to drive because the B-26 or the B-25. The B-26, yeah, yeah. The A-26, well, yes. Yeah. The B-26, it was difficult to drive because the B-26 was difficult to see that it, it didn't have a lot of area on the wind spread. Yeah. 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 The trust that we have. No business, prostitute, no visible means of support. <laughs> you remember. Any other questions? I have another one from Mr. D. Alonzo. Uh, I heard your talk in Abington, and I think it's an interesting, I think you said that you were the only one of the crew that was issued an Army 45 so you could take out the Norden bomb site that became necessary because it was top secret. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Okay, we'll have a wrap. Well, I just want to say, uh, about the people from the Netherlands and my wife always tell me to tell them the story about the baby. Well, when we were in the Netherlands uh, holding the bridges in Eindhoven on uh, the 9th, we jumped in on the 17th and we were holding the bridges on the 19th and the Luftwaffe came in and bombed us. And we were all in the Netherlands 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 and they hit a house across from where we were dug in in the ground. And at that time, two of my buddies got hit. Jim Davidson was dead. I picked him up, my hand went in his head. I knew he was gone. I got the other fellow down in the air raid shelter. And also, there's a little Dutch boy there holding a little baby. And all of a sudden, he falls over. So I grabbed the little baby, and I took it across the street, and took it to this house, and turned it over to this man. In the meantime, one of the incinerators came down the side of the house and went in the cellar, and I went and got that, and took that out on a root tray through the canal, and got rid of the incinerator bomb. The next day, this gentleman came over and gave me a little card and a little ashtray. And I didn't know for years what it said, so my friend from the Netherlands later on told me that was thank you for saving my house to run the bomb in the mine building. And he said, I'll find that man for you. So when we went back for the 50th, he had found the man a few years before, but it wasn't for me to get back to Mr. Booster. So he found the man that was in there. On the 50th, our lady that was our host had his daughter come to see us. And stupid me, you know, there was a kinder for region in the Netherlands, that's the baby factor. So I said to the daughter, how old were you then? She was oh, in the 20s. I said, where was your father hiding you then? You know, not thinking that probably she was in kinder position with a lot of Dutch girls. But, but anyhow, that's the story of the little baby. And here I got the picture of the baby and the sister and Mr. Brewster 50 years later.
and uh, went all through Normandy. He made the jump, and the stick, the stick got split. And he was an anti rash and the rash got shot through the feet. And he had to leave Andy to try and find him, and then he got captured, but then he got away again. Uh, in the Netherlands, he had a rough time again, and then when he went in to Bastogne, uh, Jake wasn't our platoon stick leader at that time. Keith Carmier was, and uh, Trigger says, "I guess I can't take it anymore because the kids and shells continue to continue to continue." So they got mad at him. They said, "Well, go turn yourself into the aid station," which he did. And then when he was there, he realized he was letting his buddies down and wanted to go back and wouldn't let him. This happened to be the 22nd, when the whole aid station got overrun. And when they overran him, they shot everybody that couldn't walk, and he was taken prisoner. Okay. Now, for years later, we tried to get Trigger to come to our reunions, but we couldn't get him to come. I've got a yellow folder in there somewhere. Our first sergeant, Old Tactic, found out where he was. So when I was visiting Florida, my wife and I walked in on him. And he was really surprised because I knew if we knew I was coming, he'd disappear. So he walked right in on him. And he stayed in. He later had a very good record. He was the first sergeant. And Betty can tell you, he's looking in the mirror, he said, Jack, I looked in that mirror before I went out to the man, and I'd say, you know, good son of a bitch, you don't belong in that uniform. Yes. And with all these problems, he's drank, he was separated, and of all things, the only one that had any sympathy, sympathy with him was a young daughter who got killed in all the mail So he really had a tough time, and this is another type of time. Anybody else? Okay. Um, it's just incredible to me that we can get nine veterans here today and every one of them great. And we really appreciate them taking time out. And I wish we could do more for them, but we really appreciate them being here. And I want to thank everybody who helped in the different round tables. Uh, probably some of you are wondering, well, how come Civil War Roundtable uh, people, Civil War buffs, would be putting on something like this? <clears throat> well, if you're a Civil War buff, can you imagine going back to 1900 and being even able to interview somebody who was in Pickett's Charge or Fort of the Wilderness or Spotsylvania? Here you're getting history from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So well, let's give them all a great hand and thank you for coming. have these certificates we'd like to give you as a little token of our appreciation. Okay, we'll raffle off the rest of our door prizes and then we'll have the drawing for the for the big raffle. <laughs>